Hello everyone and welcome to the Gazing Table. It's really great to have you with us at the India Today Conclave. And what we hope to do over the next 45 odd minutes is to go across all these uh, tables and to understand and hear from some of the people who've joined us at the Gazing Table about what to expect over the next five years. You know, as all the opinion polls are predicting at this moment, it seems that there is a high probability that the Narendra Modi government will get re-elected. And if that happens in the field of national politics, state level politics, business, foreign affairs, how is India likely to change? So the whole idea is for you to tell us things we don't know. There's a lot that's written about. You know, it's the gazing table because we are gazing into the future. You're all experts uh, in various areas and you know things we don't. So gaze into your crystal ball and tell us what you think will happen. So I want to get started with uh, this interaction by getting India's top television journalist Rajdeep Sardesai to kick things off for us and tell us how at the national political level, Rajdeep, you see things change over the next five years. What may happen which we're not anticipating? What may happen which is different from what we're seeing in front of us? Rahul, if our numbers are right, and there is a, it's a remarkable uh, election in the sense that I don't think one has seen an election where month before the election, every opinion poll is moving in the same direction and a certain predictability and inevitability seems to be there over the outcome. So if our numbers are right, Rahul, which is what, 350 to 400, for the BJP and its allies, I think we are seeing a distinct sign of Indian parliamentary democracy moving towards what I call a single party, single leader, a leader, quasi autocracy. I use the word quasi autocracy deliberately because I believe Modi's India is not Erdogan's Turkey, it is not Putin's Russia, which are frankly full blown autocracies. There is a history of democratic contestation and political pluralism that can't just be shoved aside in a decade or a decade and a half. But I do believe that the rise of this quasi-autocracy, as I call it, will have serious implications in the Indian context. And I'll just flag off four very quickly. First is the weakening of our constitutional democratic pillars. Legislature, judiciary, and I know we are in a media conclave, but bloody hell the media too. Uh, Number two, center state relations, which I think will become more and more fraught. Already we are seeing it, the announcement or the push towards a one nation, one poll could be met with resistance, but fundamentally you will see an undermining of federal principles with decisions being taken in Delhi and rammed down. So we saw it with the farm laws and you will see resistance in different parts of the country as you move towards this quasi autocracy. The second will be, uh, the third will be a north-south uh, divide. Politically irrelevant South, but an economically robust South will lead to tensions, like it or not, with a politically dominant but economically slow-moving North. Battles over equitable distribution of resources are already taking place. They will sharpen post the 16th Finance Commission, and I see that widening. And finally, because we're also in a civil society space, I see less and less space for dissent. The targeting of NGOs, which has taken place in an extremely unfortunate manner, when an institution like the Center for Policy Research, and we may have some people here who sit there, and the manner in which that institution has been targeted and the criminalization of dissent by using even organizations like the Enforcement Directorate and this terribly punitive law called the PMLA uh, to target people simply because they may have alternate opinions or because those institutions may not necessarily toe the line, I think it creates a fearful society of a kind that India was never meant to be. And yes, Rao, let me say this, and this is why, let me end on a more hopeful note. Why I call it a quasi-autocracy, while I call it a quasi-autocracy, I think also, or I hope, India is so remarkably diverse that any attempt to bring in uniformity will beyond the point lead to resistance and a backlash. Even as we speak in this lovely five-star air-conditioned room, be clear, there is a protest somewhere in some corner of the country, either on paper leaks, an issue that my friend Saurabh's Lallan Top has been taking up, but sadly most other media does not, unpaid wages, delayed justice, or as we witnessed in Manipur, in uh, the deepening 
ethnic fault lines and, and saddeningly, and as I said, unfortunately, there isn't enough attention being paid to issues like that. So net, net, Rahul, don't give up on Indian democracy, but don't be complacent either, because else we are hurtling towards becoming a quasi-autocracy. Quasi-autocracy is my, you asked me before the show, throw up a word, I think we are moving towards a quasi-autocracy. I just read a book, Revenge of Power, and uh, every, every sign of what is there, he, he has three Ps, the author Moises Naeem, post-truth, polarization, and populism. And I see all three starkly in our face in this country at the moment. I want to go across to Siddharth Zarabi, managing editor at Business Today Television, uh, to look into his crystal ball and tell us how he seem, sees the governance framework evolve over the next five years if Prime Minister Modi were to be re-elected. Siddharth. Uh, I think one of the key things that we need to put up right here is uh, consequent to the Supreme Court's uh, judgment and the plan for One India that has also been submitted uh, by the panel led by former President Ramnath Kovind, uh, reform of electoral finance, reducing the number of elections and the cost that is incurred by the Indian economy, by Indian corporates, and Indian society will be one of the key pillars that has emerged. Some days ago when the Prime Minister held his last meeting of the Council of Ministers and this was where they were all told to first have a plan for 2047 Viksit Bharat and also a 100-day agenda to sort of hit the ground running once the government comes to back to power. That's what the Council of Ministers was told. I think there will be three key programs on economics and I would say that rather than looking at the politics and imagining certain scenarios, Modi 3.0 will be clearly focused on governance and economic reform. In that, one of the key reasons for the success of this government has been taxation reform, more on the indirect tax front. You will now see direct income tax reform also coming into the agenda, hopefully this July or maybe later, that can't be predicted. The second is a continuing expansion of infrastructure, which beyond the drawing rooms and television newsrooms and the debates that we tend to do in one direction, will actually change the life of ordinary Indians. You already see people saying, hey, we just traveled 30 kilometers one side to go to work. That's changing the way suburban India, rural Bharat is connecting with urban uh, centers of growth. And that will be a key societal change driver as well, because our cities will come under pressure and our cities which are melting pots will therefore have to respond. The third bit really where we will see a lot of uh, action and change will be the ability of states and their delivery of goods of governance. In that the divide between the so-called RAVD culture as the BJP calls it, as the Prime Minister has described it and those states which are progressive will come to the forefront. So just to summarize Rahul, I think Modi 3.0 and what we can expect beyond the doomsday predictions will be economics, governance reform, and continuing to ensure that <coughs> public goods reach uh, the last person and are delivered smoothly without corruption through the last mile. Thank you. So I want to go across to Saurabh Dwevedi. Saurabh is the editor of India Today Hindi. Uh, he also heads up Lallan Top. Saurabh, uh, tell us what we don't know. You travel across the country very widely, speak to people, the real voters. How do you see India change over the next five years? Uh, can I speak in Hindi? Uh, Thank you. Rajdeep, who is saying that he is a good person. He is a good person because if he has a number of people, he will be MP and he will be a Muslim community. I can assure you. But that's for another Neta Nagri session. Wait, 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 wait. Britishers, when they started their own, they got some terracotta plates. But they were not able to study because they were not in popular Indian scripts. After that, they realized that they were not in the Brahmi and Kharoshthi. And then they realized that they were a great king, Ashok. When we were talking about Indian politics in this camera, at the same time, Indian politics has changed the grammar because when we go to the village, बिहार में पचनदा का इलाका है पांच नदियां मिलती हैं आपको देखेगा कि कुछ मछुआरों ने नदी का ठेका लेकर है ले रखा है मछलियां सुखा रहे हैं उनका एक बेटा सूखे पेड़ पर पे बैठा है और वो या तो पबजी खेल रहा है या किसी व्हाट्सएप ग्रुप में और उसके व्हाट्सएप ग्रुप पे सिर्फ स्लीजी मैसेजेस नहीं आ रहे हैं 
उनकी कम्युनिटी को लक्ष्य करते हुए कि निषाद राज के नाम पे क्या बन रहा है आपका कौन सा त्यौहार आने वाला है आपके एम या कॉरपोरेटर या प्रधान ने उसका बधाई संदेश भेजा या नहीं आइडेंटिटी के लेवल पे कल्चर के लेवल पर इतने माइक्रो प्रेशर ग्रुप्स क्रिएट हो रहे हैं आप श्रृंगार गौरी की बहस टीवी पर देख रहे हो एट द सेम टाइम कोई विक्रम संपत उस पर किताब लिख रहा है एट द सेम टाइम एक ट्विटर ट्रेंड चलाया जा रहा है कि फलाने एडिटर या ढिकाने जर्नलिस्ट इस पर अपना बुक शो करेंगे या नहीं करेंगे ये जो प्रेशर ग्रुप्स हैं चाहे वो नौकरी की भर्ती को लेकर हों चाहे वो किताब को लेके हों चाहे फिल्म को लेके हों ये एक इतनी इंटरेस्टिंग चर्निंग है जो अब जाके रिफ्लेक्ट हो रही है थ्री आइडियोलॉजिकल पिलर्स ऑफ द बीजेपी व आर्टिकल 370, सेवेंटी यूनिफॉर्म सिविल कोड एंड द राम टेम्पल सो द राम टेम्पल इज बीन डिलीवर्ड आर्टिकल थ्री सेवेंटी इज बीन एब्रिगेटेड एंड द यूनिफॉर्म सिविल कोड इज बीन इम्प्लीमेंटेड इन उत्तराखंड एंड कैन इट कैन बी इमेजिन दैट विल बी एक्सटेंडेड टू अदर स्टेट सो वॉट डज द हिंदुत्व प्रोजेक्ट होल्ड over the next 5 years what more can we expect we asked the home minister that he didn't say very much but what's happening within sudhir chaudhary our star anchor at aaj tak spends a lot of time talking to people in the bjp and the rss so sudhir bhai bataiye uh, agle 5 saal mein jahan tak hindutva project ka sawal hai aapko kya lag raha hai ki kya aham bindu ho sakte hain jis pe sarkar aur bharatiya janata party effort karegi thank you rahul uh, i think 99 0.9% people in this room they do understand english lekin main hindi mein baat karunga to pehla badlav to yahi hai ki five star hotel mein ek bahut fancy lunch ke beech mein aaj hum hindi mein baat kar sakte hain aur aane wale 5 varshon mein aapko aur zyada is tarah ki baatein aur is tarah ke events dekhne ko milenge अब आते हैं कि पाँच साल में क्या बदलाव हो सकता है मुझे लगता है आजकल एक्सप्रेस हाईवेज एक्सप्रेस वेज की बहुत बात होती है अगर मैं धर्म को एक मल्टी लेन एक्सप्रेस वे मान लूँ और उसमें अलग अलग लेन्स में अलग अलग धर्म के लोग चल रहे हैं तो उसमें शायद सबसे जो स्लो लेन अभी तक रही है वो हिंदुत्व की रही है स्लो लेन स्लो जिसमें कि अगर आप एक स्पीड किसी की तय करते हैं कि आप इस स्पीड से गाड़ी चला सकते हैं तो सबसे स्लो जो गाड़ी आपको जो स्पीड दी गई वो हिंदुत्व की थी ये कहते हुए कि आप क्योंकि बहुसंख्यक हो आप ध्यान से चलाइए आपके बगल में जो गाड़ियाँ चल रही हैं सौ सवा सौ की स्पीड पर वो माइनॉरिटीज़ की गाड़ियाँ हैं उनको कहीं चोट ना लग जाए आप ठीक से चलाइए ठीक है उसके बाद जब आप टोल देते हैं उस एक्सप्रेस पर वो टोल भी शायद बाकीों के लिए फ्री है और एक जो आपकी बहुसंख्यक कम्यूनिटी है वो हमेशा से ज़्यादा टोल देती हुई आई है अब उससे हुआ ये कि पिछहत्तर वर्षों में उस बहुसंख्यक कम्युनिटी के अंदर एक रोष पैदा हुआ एक गुस्सा पैदा हुआ अब आगे क्या होगा मैं तीन बातें बताना चाहता हूं जैसा आपने कहा कि आरएसएस का एजेंडा लगभग पूरा हो गया तो आरएसएस क्या करेगा अब क्या आरएसएस घर में बैठ जाएगा संघ क्या करेगा तो जब हम मोदी 3.0 की बात करते हैं तो अब हमें आर 2.0 की बात करनी पड़ेगी वट इज आर 2.0? एस डू ना तो आर शायद अपने आप को थोड़ा री करेगा संघ का एजेंडा शायद अब जागृति होगा क्योंकि जो उन्होंने अचीव करना था वो हो गया राम मंदिर को मैं देखता हूं कि राम मंदिर उन्नीस के वर्ल्ड कप जैसा है उन्नीस का वर्ल्ड कप जब हमने जीता था तो पूरे देश में एक क्रिकेट को लेकर विश्वास आया था हम अंडरडॉग हुआ करते थे और उसके बाद तब से लेकर आज आप देखिए आज हमारी तीनों टीम्स नंबर वन टीम्स हैं और क्रिकेट में हम कहाँ आ गए मुझे ऐसा लगता है कि दिस राम मंदिर मोमेंट वाज लाइक 83 वर्ल्ड कप फॉर द हिंदूज अब आरएसएस और बीजेपी का रिश्ता ये क्या होगा अगले पांच साल में या अभी तक भी अगर आप देखेंगे बीजेपी को जो जमीनी मजबूती मिलती है बाकी पार्टीज के मुकाबले वो आरएसएस की वजह से मिलती है अगर आरएसएस हट गया तो बीजेपी भी वैसे ही हो जाएगी जैसी कांग्रेस या कोई और पार्टी और अगर आरएसएस मजबूत हुआ और आरएसएस ने ये सौ करोड़ हिंदुओं की अवेकनिंग की तो फिर बीजेपी को बीट करना बहुत मुश्किल होगा क्योंकि द मेजर डिफ्रेंशिएशन बिटवीन बीजेपी एंड अदर पार्टीज इज दैट अदर पार्टीज डू नॉट है ग्राउंड ऑर्गेनाइजेशन लाइक आर वर्किंग For them, so RSS will function like a buffer, 
और वन नेशन वन इलेक्शन की जो हम बात कर रहे हैं वन नेशन वन वन इलेक्शन से आपके जो विपक्षी पार्टियों के नेता हैं ये आलसी बन जाएंगे लोगों को शायद बुरा लगे लेकिन ये आलसी बन जाएंगे क्योंकि इनको हर साल छः महीने में जो एक पावर का एक बूस्टर मिलता था पहले कि आपने एक छोटा सा चुनाव जीत लिया उसके बाद हवा बन गई फिर किसी ने एक और छोटा चुनाव जीत लिया वो हवा बन गई वो पाँच साल तक जो एक धैर्य चाहिए होता है राजनीति में वो मुझे लगता है कि बहुत कम हमारे देश में ऐसे नेता और पार्टियां होंगी जो पाँच साल बिना सत्ता के बाहर रह सकते हैं या मे भी दस या पंद्रह साल भी बाहर रह सकते हैं तो मुझे ऐसा लगा कि शायद बीजेपी हिंदुत्व को कलेक्टिवली एक अवेकनिंग का एक मोमेंट देकर अपनी तरफ करेगी आर उसमें बहुत मदद करेगी हमारे देश में मुसलमानों की एक्सक्लूसिव पार्टियां हैं दलितों की एक्सक्लूसिव पार्टियां हैं ओ की अलग से पार्टियां हैं जो सिर्फ इसी नाम पर वोट मांगती हैं अगर ये सारे लोग एक हिंदू की तरह वोट देना शुरू कर देंगे तो बीजेपी का वोट शेयर आप समझ सकते हो कितना हो जाएगा अगले पांच साल में इसकी कोशिश की जाएगी और शायद एक्सक्लूसिव वोटिंग इन द नेम ऑफ हिंदुत्व शायद शुरू हो जाएगी आप अभी से बदलाव देखिए मैं छोटे छोटे बदलाव आपको बताता हूँ भजन का कितना बड़ा बाजार हमारे देश में आ गया है लोग भजन सुन रहे हैं भजन सुपर हिट है फिल्मों में जो बदलाव है आप देखिए आज आपको 370 पर फिल्म देखने को मिल रही है बस्तर पर फिल्म देखने को मिल रही है केरला पर मिल रही है कश्मीर पर मिल रही है एंड ऑल दीज फिल्म आर डूइंग एक्सट्रीमली वेल तो जो लोग ये कहते हैं कि ये सब एक हो जाएगा मोनोपली आ जाएगी ये मोनोपली आएगी लेकिन लोगों की मर्जी से आ रही है लोगों की इच्छा से आ रही है इस देश ने एक हजार साल गुलामी का देखा जब या तो इस्लाम का रूल था या क्रिश्चियनिटी का रूल था और अब पिछहत्तर साल एक खास तरह की डेमोक्रेसी देखी जो बिल्कुल लूज थी और अब शायद लोग मुझे ऐसा लगता है कि लोग आएंगे और लोग इस वैचारिक जो ब्लॉकिंग है हिंदुत्व को लेकर वो दूर होगी आखिरी पॉइंट मेरा यह है जय श्री राम एक बड़ा अग्रेसिव नारा बन गया था ये एक राजनीति से जुड़ गया था और लोग जय श्री राम जैसे ही बोलते थे आपको एक खास तरीके से देखते थे क्रिसमस ट्री फैशनेबल है इफ्तार अटेंड करना बहुत फैशनेबल है लेकिन टीका लगा के कहीं व्रत पे जाना या कोई आयोजन करना फैशनेबल नहीं है अब शायद लोग मंदिर के बाहर जाकर टीका लगा के रखेंगे वो जो शर्मिंदगी है वो समाप्त हो जाएगी और जय श्री राम के बाद जय सियाराम का नारा आएगा विच विल बी मोर इंक्लूसिव विच वुड बी सॉफ्ट विच वुड बी यू नो एप्लीकेबल टू ऑल और जिससे किसी को डर नहीं लगेगा तो इसमें जो डर की बात है ना कि ये जो जय श्री राम अगर बड़ा हो गया या हिंदुत्व जो, जो है अगर इकट्ठा हो गया इस्लाम इकट्ठा हुआ क्रिश्चियनिटी इकट्ठा हुआ सिख इकट्ठे हुए तो क्या हुआ ये देश ऐसे ही चल रहा है आज भी ऐसे ही चल रहा है अगर ये हिंदू भी इकट्ठे हो गए तो ये किसी को मारने वाले नहीं अगर आप हमारा इतिहास देखेंगे तो हिंदुत्व जो है सबसे इंक्लूजन वाला धर्म रहा है सो so, आखिर में मैं ये कहना चाहता हूँ वील गो टूवर्ड्स जय सिया राम वील लीव जय श्री राम और जय सिया राम में फिर आपके दलित भी आ जाएंगे आपके ओ बी सी भी आ जाएंगे जो भी हिंदू होगा वो उसमें शामिल होगा तो वीर सिंह टू वेरी डिफरेंट पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू वन इज दैट इंडिया गेट्स मोर इंक्लूसिव इस दी अदर इज दैट इट बिकम्स मोर एक्सक्लूसिव इस पवन वर्मा इज वन ऑफ द कंट्रीज टॉप पोलिटिकल थिंकर्स एंड वे डी यू कम आउट ऑन वेदर वी हैड टूवर्ड्स मोर इंक्लूजन और फार ग्रेटर एक्सक्लूजन पवन i am not one of those who is a proponent that we are heading towards some kind of extinction of democracy yes there is a threat to it par ek ghalib ki line hai har bulandi ke naseebon mein hai pasti ek din in every pinnacle's genes lies the seeds of its own defeat and indian politics is dynamic if you ask somebody in 1971 about indira gandhi and that she would in 4 years be forced to impose an emergency most people would have said she is durga she will never be defeated the same would apply to rajiv gandhi where in 84 with 404 mps if anyone then asked him whether in 89 he would be fighting to win people would dismiss it so i believe the inherent strength of india are its people and its democracy and we should never underestimate them that's point number 1 so no leader no party is invincible secondly 
I believe that in the future, however much a government seeks to impose what uh, my good friend Rajib, Rajdeep calls quasi-authoritarianism, autocracy. autocracy. Oh, you changed He's preparing it. a book, sir. Ah. <laughs> Quasi-autocracy. I think there is something called an authoritarian democracy, where democracy becomes the means by which within a constitution like that of India's, you can have an absolute booth majority in the Lok Sabha and a manageable majority in the Raj Sabha and you can pass laws which would otherwise be difficult to pass. But my own prediction for the next five years is that any political party which becomes so individual-centric on only one individual, where even in the campaign today the party is not mentioned and only a guarantee of an individual is mentioned, will ultimately also face the challenge when there is once again another charismatic face, another narrative, another strategy and another level of organization. Now, one point I wanted to respond to Sudhirji. Yes, there is a need for the reappropriation of a culture which had been neglected. And I have written a book called The Great Hindu Civilization where I seek to do it. But if this process becomes one of majoritarianism and the exclusion of the other minorities in this country, which are in sufficiently large numbers if excluded to cause endemic instability, I believe the growth story that India wants also will be affected. There is a dynamic link between economic growth and social harmony. Well, I want to go across to Sushant Sarin and get a sense of how you see the Indian state evolve over the next five years. Uh, we've heard some good shades, we've heard some areas of concern. From your perch, Sushant, or from your position on the table, where do you see India go? Tell us what we don't know, what we can't see in our front view. Uh, if you want to stand that. Just, just a slight aside, um, there are as many Muslims living in my colony today as were living 20 years back. Um, and it's the good thing about what is happening today is that at least everybody is recognized that there was a neglect of Hinduism in this country that they were pushed against the wall and there's a reaction taking place. Uh, some people can't handle it, other people are quite comfortable with it. Uh, but yeah, where, are we, where is the state going? I think the state has become far more effective. Uh, the ability of the state to deliver goods on the ground have become far more effective. If I'm not mistaken, it was Venkat who had told me uh, just on the eve of the last election results, and he was very prescient uh, at that point of time, he predicted it almost to the T. Um, and, and the way the state has started touching the lives of people who were neglected. Votes were taken in their names, but they were neglected. I think that, uh, that delivery system has become far more effective. Uh, you know, we've all been journalists, at least most of the people in this room, uh, and we have this habit of picking up outliers and then making it out to say that, Look, because this exception has happened, this whole scheme is flawed. Exceptions will always happen. But I think if you look at the larger picture, the state has become far more effective. It's become far more responsive. Uh, when was the state, uh, and incidentally, we're talking about all kinds of riots, uh, people seem to forget the kind of pogroms which used to take place when we are a very secular, progressive democracy. And there's a state in the east of India where post-election violence uh, should have ashamed everybody, but many people kept quiet at that point of time. Uh, so I think uh, what is going to happen is that the state uh, is going to become touching the lives of a lot of people. What my fear, however, is that while I think there's a, there's a greater degree of economic realism which has come in, I think the economic policies are moving in the right direction. Uh, I'm not so confident about how the international situation is going to play out. And that is a matter of some concern because the international system is going to be in very, very serious flux going forward. We don't know what's going to happen. We probably know what's going to happen in the US. 
uh, come November. What, what will happen in the US in November? Probably looks like Trump is going to be sweeping the polls. Anju Gupta is here. She used to be with uh, India's external intelligence agency, has been an officer in the police force in different capacities, and is really a top expert on terrorism and counterterrorism. So, Anju, if you give our sense of how you see the terrorism situation and national security evolve over the next five years. Uh, thank you, Rahul. It's an honor to be here. Uh, on security side, the most important thing is that it's a very fluid situation, as always. And there's far greater link between the geopolitics and security, something that one has to be mindful of. Uh, I'll just put forward three points, two small and one big. To put everything in pers to put it in perspective, I'll begin with uh, you know just very briefly defining what is jihadi international terrorism, to make the points that I'll be making. So these are violent acts which are you know inspired by or linked to jihadi international terrorist groups. Classic examples are Al Qaeda and Daesh, as we know, uh, Islamic State as we call them, and these are designated either by the UN or the US, the two actors who have uh, created the security architecture to deal with counterterrorism, etc. Uh, but I want to take you back to the you know original ideology. It all originated in Egypt, where uh, Hassan al Banna and Saeb Qutb they put together this ideology and it created what we know as Muslim Brotherhood. Muslim Brotherhood was uh, essentially created against the Arab rulers and the Western backers, for whatever grievances they had pan, you know, across the Arab states. Uh, Hamas is a Palestinian offshoot of Muslim Brotherhood. That's the point number one I wanted to make. So after Daesh and Al-Qaeda, is the world going to see a third, third wave of international terrorism inspired by Hamas, linked I don't know. I think it's too early to make a comment on that, but I'm just leaving a food for thought here. Second is to get some uh, sense about where the international security is going, some numbers. And I'm quoting here reliable uh, external sources, which are basically um, open source think tanks, very reliable. In terms of numbers, there are about 3,500 incidents that the world has seen in 2023, leading to about 8,500 deaths. Uh, the violence is confined to primarily three, three regions. One is Sub-Sahara, second is MENA, as we call it, Middle East, North Africa, and third is our own region, South Asia. Now, in terms of, purely in terms of number, 50% violence is now re being reported in Sub-Sahara region, and that too in Sahel. But again, by the affiliates of Daesh and Al-Qaeda, which are re really become the local groups. So all these affiliates of Daesh and Al-Qaeda that we see around the world, including our region, are basically local groups that are just using the brands. I thought it's important to make that point. Um, then the next important uh, theater, uh, which is really evolving, is MENA, Middle East and North uh, Africa. We know with the fall of the caliphate of Daesh in March 2019, the Daesh has been declining. And today, Daesh across Syria and Iraq, which were their principal areas, has have become local insurgencies. South Asia, the story is of really Afghanistan and Pakistan. In Afghanistan, the incidents are very low because Taliban has become the ruler. So from 5,000 incidents, they've come down to about 40, which are again blamed on the local affiliate of Daesh, as we call it. But the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan is huge. And that crisis can lead to explosion of Afghanistan in more ways than one. For the paucity of time, I wouldn't say more than that. But Pakistan is a big story, where TTP and the Baloch groups have created havoc with Pakistani forces, more than 1,400 attacks in 2023, and all against their forces. The casualty figure is close to 3,000. Uh, what is also important to understand that is tension in this region between Afghanistan and Pakistan, huge. We don't know how it will pan out between Iran and Pakistan. We've seen the Iranian strikes into four countries recently and between Afghanistan and, uh, Afghanistan and Iran. Uh, my very last point is that I think it's time has come uh, for, also, uh, uh, for us to also expand the ambit of what we call counterterrorism, taking a cue from the West and the UN, okay. whereby they have expanded their counterterrorism work to include what they call countering violent extremism, which is to basically prevent uh, you know, the conditions that lead to radicalization 
And the very last point is that here they are not only talk about radicalization due to jihadi narrative, but all other radicalization. It's a big thing in the world today. And the whole world is moving in that direction. So I could say so more thank, on TV. Thank you but for thank that. You. But we'll have to actually call you and do a thank you know, you, something thank always you. very special about a recently retired officer because they have so much insights which are very special. Arvind Subramaniam, uh, one of our sharpest economic minds. We've heard different shades of civil society, democracy, politics from an economic prism. How do you see the India story shape up over the next five years? What do you see which others who don't understand numbers as well can't see? So, so uh, can I just make a prefatory remark that, you know, one of the cardinal sins of forecasting is to extrapolate the recent past. And, and, and Keynes had this famous line that the inevitable never happens, it's the unexpected always. <laughs> uh, so, so I think with that caveat in mind, um, um, you know, l l just, uh, you know, a think ahead. You know, I, I think that... Um, there is a genuinely optimistic possibility going forward uh, uh, for India, uh, which, I mean, building on all the cumulative achievements of the last 20 years, and you know, it's the state being able to deliver at scale, to build infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, uh, are, are key parts of that. Um, so in this optimistic scenario, I think, uh, I see the China plus one opportunity as really being a game changer. Potentially, all this is potential. Nothing is for certain, uh, because you know we could never do a certain kind of manufacturing. We were always doing this high-skilled, somewhat non-inclusive dynamism that we had from services. But I think the China plus one genuinely, I think, gives India a second shot. See, India will never become a China. You know, India will never do exports of the sort. But even if India goes from, you know, three to four percent of global exports to 10, 11 percent, I think it's a potential kind of game changer. Um, uh, that's, uh, I think, th that's to me is something that's genuinely new that's happening. You know, Apple coming, lots of these Korean, Vietnamese firms coming, Tesla may be coming, and all of this is happening. Uh, that's a. Uh, the second, I think, uh, genuinely a thing that could change India is Uttar Pradesh. I think s stuff is happening there, again, very early to say. But, you know, if Uttar Pradesh can get its act together, I mean, it changes India fundamentally in so many ways. I mean, the whole Bimaru pejorative, the Hindi heartland as being north-south divide, I mean, that offers a scope for fundamentally changing things about India. Opinion seems to be divided about growth numbers as well, whether these numbers paint the true picture or do they paint a picture more optimistic than the reality would suggest. Based on all the budgets you've made and all the ministries that you've helped run, how do you see India shape up economically over the next five years? So, um, uh, my sense is the, you see, there is, in economics, there is always a continuum. You do tomorrow what and the seeds are sown today. So the third term will flow from what has happened in the second term. In the second term, while there's been an uh, enormous amount of highly visible investments in railways, roads, and other buildings and all, and in last two or three years, a very decent growth rate of about 7% plus for continuously three years, it hides enormous vulnerabilities which India has built in. Uh, the fact that first two years were very poor, uh, uh, in fact, negative growth uh, in that pandemic year, leaves us for five years growth at about only about 4% or 4.2%, which is one of the lowest growth in last 30 years for a, for a term of the prime minister uh, or a party. Likewise, we have built these investments uh, on the deathbed of very vibrant institutions financially, like the NHAI and the railway uh, corporations and others, and brought entire funding of that into the fiscal uh, sort of domain of the central government, running the very large fiscal deficits of 6.5% for five years on an average, the highest ever fiscal deficit in the country. 
the the pro, the image which is built third largest economy going to be and this kind of thing again hides the fact that we set out for 2425 a goal of 5 trillion dollar that required us to only cover a gap of 2.3 trillion dollars from where we were in 2018 19 and we covered less than 0.8 trillion dollars less than one third okay. 24 25 is nowhere we we'll need to uh, be to a 28 29 to be re to reach in there now if you build the future from that so the narrative is changing narrative is changing from specific to general viksit bharat is the successor of very specific 5 trillion or 10 trillion dollar kind of thing but viksit bharat is not even defined what do we mean by viksit bharat so i hope as we go into the third term we'll define what it is and how do we handle the vulnerabilities which have got built into the fiscal side, the government's capacity to finance the investment in the five years to come is very weak. The private sector is not financing investment. The public sector is, has become incapable of financing the uh, investment. The government's vulnerability in times to come will force. So in this situation, we have also made the states which were the co-engine, the second engine, double engine, uh, if you turn the states into some sort of kind of a trolley rather than an engine, you have a problem of the entire nation not firing for uh, building the growth. Okay, so I see weaknesses in the next year. Of course, we'll be very high on ambition. And we must do it. Well, potential is great, but we'll need to have the right kind of policy. Yeah. Nitin Gokhale, from a security perspective, how do you see the relationship with China or the relationship with Pakistan evolve in the next five years? There's been some talk that Prime Minister Modi, in his bid to go down in history as an Indian legend, will attempt some kind of a rapprochement with Pakistan in his third term. Is that just conspiracy and rumor mills, or could there be some truth to it? Tell us what we don't know. Well, I don't think uh, that's going to happen. I think China will continue to remain our primary challenge. One good thing that has happened in the past five years, or let's four years from 2020, is that the entire nation is now aware that China is the primary threat. Earlier, we were obsessed with Pakistan. We do apologies to Anju and Sushant here, uh, and, and the Delhi's uh, crowd, Lieutenant's crowd, which was so obsessed. Uh, I, I, I was in <laughs> 23 years ago. I was in the Northeast, so I am not a Delhiite. Um, so anyway, that is aside. Uh, China remains primary challenge. Uh, I think national security architecture will continue to be reformed and improved uh, for better delivery. Uh, so are the defense forces going to get uh, better. But one warning here is that India will have to fend for itself. It has always done so in the past, but much more acutely as far as international security situation is concerned. Nor you, neither US nor, um, say, UK or France, anybody is going to come to your aid. You have to deal with China bilaterally and uh, get your act right as far as fending of China is concerned. And China is not coming at you only from the security point of view, it is coming to you from technology, it is denying you access to uh, technology, it is making inroads in the cognitive domain. So that we must be focused on. Uh, and uh, I think the government will be focused on. One final uh, point I want to make about uh, what are the threats to national security. I think we are focused on borders, we are focused on Pakistan. And Pakistan, to me, is a subset of the China challenge. I think let's get that straight because of their nexus and their closeness. But I worry about the largest migration that is taking place from rural India to urban or urban centers or urban India. And that has seeds of national security threats, which are not very visible right now, for various reasons. One, our cities are not able to cope with the largest migration in history. Second, because of that, law and order is going to be your major issue. And there are police officers here who will probably tell you that. Radicalization, she has already spoken about. And the fact that aspirations of these people do not match their qualifications will mean leading to more petty crimes, which will be a major challenge to any government going forward. I think that we should be cognizant about. Very interesting. Ashutosh and Professor Mehrotra, uh, how do you see Indian society and politics change over the next five years? Ashutosh first. 
stand up? Yeah. See, first of all, I don't believe into the theory of inevitability that uh, Modi is coming. So as a journalist, I can't predict what is going to happen. Uh, but yes, if he's coming, if, if he's coming, uh, there is a greater danger, greater danger in the sense, and I've always said it, that uh, the country is moving towards a historical accident. And it, do, it does happen. In, in, in history, it, it has happened many, many times. Uh, because uh, at least uh, last few days, I've been reading the integral humanism of Deen Dhyal Upadhyay. Uh, 1965, the third chapter. And if anybody reads that, uh, one uh, is, is really will thinking that whether uh, this democracy has any place in RSS thinking? I don't think so, because he theorizes and theorizes and theorizes and reaches to the conclusion that India should be a dharmaraj. Dharmaraj means what? He explains that. And he said dharmaraj means the dharma should be supreme. The majority should not be supreme. The parliament should not be supreme. The people should not be supreme. So dharma should be supreme. If somebody is on the side of the dharm, somebody is on the side of the dharm, even if he's in minority, his voice should be supreme. Now, if that is the that is the interpretation of that is where the thinking of RSS is going, then I really dread. And I could find a, a, a parallel with when I gaze in the future and this establishment continues with the kind of ideology they have, then what I think is the nearest possible political model is Iran. Because in According to that, somebody has to sit and decide what is dharma. Whether this government is run according to dharma, whether the parliament is running according to dharma, whether this uh, government is running according to dharma, what is that? How will you decide that? So in that sense, it's like Iran. There is a, there's a council of clerics. Who decide whether the, the government is run according to the, the, to the sharia? Are we moving in that direction? And why I'm saying so? For the simple reason, because Unfortunately or fortunately, ideology with any kind of ideology, and I have done a lot of research on ideologies, any kind of ideology, it has an inherent, it has inherent quality to, clear, to, to create a delusional society where the humanites are fighting invisible phantoms. And they always believe that they are part of the nation building process. They are doing something which is greatest ever, so the sense of achievement is high. And one point I would like to say, and I completely disagree with uh, 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 ji, when he makes a distinction between Bajrang Dal and Narendra Modi and RSS. Frankly speaking, there is one organization that is called RSS. It's like a one big umbrella under which in the different silos. Everybody has been given a different task, different roles. Okay. Bajrang Dal is not, is not, has never been disowned by the RSS. So the fact of the matter is, people who believe about Hindutva, do they really know Hindutva? Yeah, Basti, so right Ashutosh quick. talks about Hindutva, right? As if all of us here are illiterate or we've not read anything. I'm not sure if he has read Savarkar or I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Rahul. Is what it is Savarkar? it this organization to make a personal Savarkar? comment about no, me? I'm I, I, I want to know this. No, I want to know this. No, no, I want to know this. Rahul, Rahul. Is this, are is this, make is point. this, yeah, no, are, are, you, are you allowing me to, to make a personal comment on me? Don't make a personal comment. I, no, I, I protest, I protest, I protest. Constitution of Hindu okay, Rashtra? He's, he's thrown up some ideas, respond to those ideas. <laughs> Savarkar's Constitution of Hindu Rashtra is very clear. It says in a Hindu Rashtra, there will be individual rights. And this conception of Hindu Rashtra comes from the 1848 revolutions of Europe when nationalism was supposed to be of a constructive variety where it basically said that if you have a spiritual and ancestral attachment to a piece of land, anybody who owes that allegiance is a nationalist. So that's the problem. Ashutosh ji really okay. needs to read theory. He reads, needs to read Savarkar so that he can understand what Hindutva is. Hindutva has always had a reformist streak. So this will become streak. a debate, OK? And no, we no, need Hindutva to get to the other room. Hindutva has always had a reformist streak <laughs> because had there not been for this reformist streak, Hindutva would have never started winning elections. Rahul. In India, the forward caste population is less than 20%. So just if you get, even if you get 70 or 80% of their support out of that 20%, that is only 16%. Okay. Modi polled 45% of the vote, including the allies last time, which is almost equal to what Indira Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru polled in their salad days. So this is something 
that the old elite, the old guard cannot comprehend, they cannot tolerate this. Okay, we've spoken a lot about politics. I want to spend a moment on foreign affairs and ask Ambassador Nupama Rao to talk about how India's position on the global head table potentially changes. The equations we've been able to build with the Gulf Arab states, continuing our equation uh, and strategic uh, ties with the United States, walking a gentle trapeze uh, between Russia and Ukraine. How do you see things change? What's your crystal ball telling you? There's always a continuum in foreign policy. You know, whatever you may say, it's not a question of reinvention. Perhaps there are uh, attempts to uh, provide it with a much higher profile image, which I think is quite understandable given our growing strengths and our recognized potential across the global stage. But, you know, our foreign minister said just last year, and I quote, our opinions count, our views matter, and have actually today the ability to shape the big issues of our time. So in the next five years, I'd like to see that ability being played out, being realized, the ability to shape the big issues of our time. And I think that day, that Amrit Kal we have to wait for. And I'd also like to add, and I think we need to ask ourselves this searching question, are we part of the conversation when we are not in the global room? You know, face to our faces, we are showered with encomiums, hosannas being sung, but when we are not in the room, are we part of the conversation? And then when we say this is not a time for war and a time for peace, what are the opportunities we can create for peace? I think there has to be less risk aversion on our part as far as that is concerned. Coming to China, now the situation on the line of actual control, I don't believe miracles are going to happen. There is a certain stasis in the relationship with China today. It's fraught with tension albeit stable, more or less stable. And I think the government has been right in treating this issue with circumspection and caution, which is one of the lessons we've learned from history. And I'm glad we have done so. You know, I'm very hopeful for this country. However, we have to, over the next five years, do three things which I don't believe we are on the path to. First, we have to resume a growth path of 8 to 9% per annum because if we don't, we will not be generating the jobs that we need. And without the jobs, the real wages will not rise. And without the real wages rising and consumption demand domestically rising, private investment is not going to pick up, point one. Related to this, I don't believe the intelligentsia in this country and certainly not the political, political class in this country have even begun to understand that we are at the end of our demographic dividend. In 16 years, our dividend is running out, before 2040. We are not a young country. I know this from conversations with cabinet ministers, that they believe, oh, we are still a young country. I'd like to sort of establish the following data in your, in your minds. The f that six years ago, th only 32% of our workforce was over 45. Today, 49% of our workforce, 49% of our workforce is over 45. In 15 years, when our dividend runs out, we, they will all be aging. We will be a, a very rapidly aging society, becoming old without becoming rich. So we have no choice but to grow at 8 to 9% per annum, and this growth rate will, over the next decade and a half, decline for a variety of reasons, including climate change, including and we cannot possibly allow for the north-south divide to grow in the way that, that Arvind was rightly hinting at. And others have also already hinted at, as Rajdeep did. If we do, there will be a break on this growth rate. There will be a break on job growth. There will be a break on real wages. And finally, and I'm closing, if we become an aging society in 16 years' time, without becoming a rich country. 16, it's not 2047, I'm sorry to say. Then we have a disaster on our hands, no question about it. And I guarantee you, because of climate change, 
the growth rate will decline, will decline, will decline. And, and finally, if we become an authoritarian democracy, an electoral democracy, as we are well on our path to becoming, we will undermine each of the goals that we actually want to achieve. Higher growth, more jobs, real wages increasing, private investment increasing, so that we come, we become Vixit Bharat. Thank you very much. Okay, Asha Motwani Jadeja is a Silicon ten Valley seconds. investor, looks at the India story very carefully. From your perch Just, in the Bay Area, yeah. how Just do you ten, see India change? 10 seconds. If, you know, for whatever it's worth, um, I have never seen this level, this quality, and this number of startups coming from Kashmir. And uh, they are 99.9% Muslim-led. I don't know how to sort of, if you want to interpret it as, uh, you know, as a good sign, I think it's, it's, I think it's fabulous. It's fabulous that we have so many startups there. And they are, they are coming out of the woodworks. They are excellent quality. And I must say I'm delighted to be investing in Kashmir right now. And it just gives me the sense that if this is reflective of the general optimism in India right now, the general sense of the youth that they can pull off businesses irrespective of religion, then I think this is a, this is a vote of confidence that whatever we are doing, something, something really good is cooking here. So usually uh, at a conversation or in a debate, you get to hear a couple of points of view, such a wide range of perspectives about what's going right, what's going wrong. We were able to track that all here at the gazing table. So thank you for joining us and thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.